What we've done so far is that we've looked at random variables like the Bernoulli and the binomial and the continuous version, the normal distribution. These are univariate distributions because there's only one variable involved in the examples that I showed you, right? So, but we can have situations where you have more than one variable involved. This can happen in, a, in an experiment or in a data collection situation. So an example would be if you're collecting the heights, measuring the heights and weights of a sample from a population, now you have two variables that you're looking at. And each of these two variables is assumed to have a random variable associated with it. That means it has either a probability mass function or a probability density function associated with it. So now when we're talking about two or even more than two random variables being considered simultaneously, then we are in the world of bivariate or multivariate distributions. So I'm going to start by talking about the discrete case first. Okay. So uh, if you look here, this data comes from uh, one of my uh, former students' PhD dissertations. Right? There are two variables involved in this experiment. This is a psycholinguistic experiment. And what we did was we collected accuracy responses, which are 0, 1 responses. This, of course, comes from the Bernoulli now. right? So you can assume a Bernoulli likelihood there. And the other response that we're getting from each participant simultaneously, along with the 0, 1 response, is a Likert rating response. So rating from 1 to 7, where 7 could be perfectly acceptable. These are sentences, you know and um, one would be unacceptable, right? So we have two random variables, and what we want to consider now is the joint distribution of these two random variables. Now we're not talking about only one random variable. If you were talking only about the 0, 1 responses, right? Those would be coming from a Bernoulli distribution. But we also have this other random variable x that's simultaneously involved in the experiment. So we have two that we have to consider simultaneously. And we have to also now consider the joint probability mass function of these two random variables. So graphically, you know, you can visualize this joint probability mass function as I've shown you here. This is the actual data from my uh, students' work. And so what you see here is on one axis, you see the 0, 1 responses. On the other axis, you see the Likert responses. And on the y axis, right, so the axis going upwards, that's representing the joint probability of this. So, what does this look like numerically, right? If you look at it as a table, this figure, we would see something like this. So, what you see on the x axis, uh, sorry, not on the x axis, but on the horizontal, you know, the rows, you see the 0, 1 responses, the probabilities of those for each of the Likert responses ranging from 1 to 7, right? So, this we are going to call the joint probability mass function of these two random variables. They are both discrete random variables, right? That's why I'm saying joint probability mass function. If they had been both continuous random variables, then they would be, they, this would be a joint um, uh, probability density function, right? Okay, so this is the joint probability mass function of these two random variables. And what I want to show you now is that there are several important things that you can get out of this joint distribution, right? So, the first important thing you can figure out from a joint probability mass function or probability density function is the marginal distribution of each of those two random variables. So notice that there are two random variables. Each of those two random variables has its own probability mass function, right? And you can figure that ma probability mass function out by calculating the marginal distribution. And the way you compute it is, for example, for the variable x, right? If I want to figure out the probability mass function, the marginal distribution of the variable x, ignoring the y values, what I do is I take look at the joint distribution table that I just showed you earlier and sum up all the values, all the y values, right, that I have there. And once I sum up all the joint probabilities, what I'm doing is I'm marginalizing out all the y values. And so I get the joint probability mass function for x, and do the, you can do the same thing for y, right? This time, you marginalize out the x values. So how does that work in practice? Let me show you. 
what we are going to do now is that we're going to figure out here in this table, I've added a column here and a row here. This column is showing you the marginal probability of the variable y. And so the variable y has only two possible outcomes, 0 and 1, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all these probabilities for each of the seven responses, Likert responses for y equal to 0, sum those up and I get this to 0.291 here, and I can do the same thing for y equal to one, right? So that's this. You should notice that this probability mass function is a proper one because it sums up to one. You can confirm that, right? Similarly, I can figure out the marginal uh, uh, distribution, the probability mass function for x, for the random variable x, by computing these uh, seven probabilities here, right? I summing, I'm summing up everything here, and I'm going to get this row here. And if I sum up these rows, they should also sum to one. You can check that if you like, right? So what I have now done is that I took the joint probability mass function for this bivariate distribution, and I figured out the marginal distributions of each of those two random variables using this formula that I just showed you. It's pretty straightforward, right? It's just addition, nothing more. Okay, and you can also visualize these marginal distributions like this. This is your Bernoulli now, and this is your um, uh, the Likert, right? So everything is pretty straightforward here. And so uh, the other thing that you can compute with the joint probability mass function is the conditional distribution of x given y and the conditional distribution of y given x, right? So how does that work? Now, Perhaps you remember from school, perhaps you saw this in school. If you didn't, this might be the first time you're seeing this formula, but it's a pretty straightforward formula. The formula is, this is the definition of conditional probability, right? And the definition states that the conditional probability of x given y, that vertical bar is a conditionality statement, right? So the, the distribution of x given some particular value of y, right? is going to be the joint distribution of x and y divided by the uh, marginal distribution of that particular value of y that we are talking about. Okay, I'll give you an example, of course. And similarly, you can reverse the x's and y's and get the conditional distribution of y and x, y given x here. Okay? So that's the definition of conditional probability that we are using here to compute the conditional distributions. Okay, So these are probability distributions, probability mass functions, right? For particular values of one variable, for example, y, I'm going to figure out the distribution of x, okay? So how do I do that? Let's take a look, okay? So here I have the table again. I've got the joint distribution here, and I've got the marginal distributions here for particular values, you know? For x, y equal to 0, I've got this one here. For y equal to 1, I've got this one here, and so on, right? For x, for x as well, right? So let's now figure out what the probability of observing one, that is x equal to one, given that y is equal to zero. What's the probability of x being equal to one, given that y is equal to zero? So how do I do that? Well, I just refer to the rule that I had just shown you, right? I look up the joint probability of one and zero, so x and y here. What's the joint probability of x equal to one and y equal to zero? That's this one here. 0.018. So that's what I write here, right? And in the denominator, I'm going to figure out the probability of y being equal to 0 because 0 is the uh, the conditional value that I'm looking at here, okay? So what's the probability of y being equal to 0? For this, I have to look up the marginal distribution, right? So to compute the conditional distribution, I have to know what the marginal distributions are, right? So, but I have that here, right? So what is the, the marginal probability of y uh, being equal to zero, well, I can just look that up. It's this 0.291 here. So I plug that in here. If I compute this, I get 0 0.062. I hope that's correct. You can check that. And um, so what I've just done is that I've figured out the conditional probability of one of the x outcomes given one of the y outcomes, right? So what we basically are doing now is that we are going to fill out this table, and this table will then give us this conditional probability, you know, conditional distribution of x given y, right? For each of these possible outcomes, right? I did this one for you, but I strongly advise you to pause the video and quickly compute all these things. You basically just have to repeat the calculation that I've done here for different values, you know, of x and y here.
okay? and you will get the conditional distributions here. So that's basically the, the whole story with the discrete uh, uh, bivariate distribution. right? Now, uh, what we are going to do next is that we're going to take these ideas of the marginal distribution and the conditional distribution, which are so easy to compute in the discrete case because they just involve simple either summation for the marginal or just simple division you know, for the conditional distribution. This is easy to understand conceptually. We're going to use these ideas to think about continuous random variables now in the bivariate and more generally, you know, the multivariate case where you have more than two random variables, okay? So that will be the next lecture.